Father God, we just thank you so much for the love that you showed to us. Help us all to remember, Lord, that no matter what we're going through, there is no one higher than you. That with your help, when we cry out to you, Lord, you are there to bring healing in our lives, in our circumstances. And we thank you for that, Father. Lord, we just pray your presence be here today. That your Holy Spirit would be moving among us. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears to hear your word. And just may it rest in us. May we absorb it and truly hear it and understand it. And may we just place all our trust in you, knowing that you are the truth. And in you we have rest. We thank you, Father, and we just praise you and give you all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. You're next. Come on in. How you doing? Good, Welcome sir. to the Temp Agency. Thank you. Thank you for meeting with me, Mr. Uh, Wormwood. I mean, Mr. Hornswoggle. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all right. No problem. No problem. I'm just a little nervous. That's okay. So, tell me about yourself, Evan. Where are you from? Well, um, hell, sir. Well, obviously. Well, <laughs> well, first off, I just want to tell you that. I truly believe that I am your demon, but uh, where I actually live, I actually live on the north side of the Lake of Fire. Oh, oh, okay. That's a nice area. <laughs> and we'll have to see if uh, you, you're what I'm looking for. Okay. We gotta wait on that yet. <laughs> Just uh, tell me about yourself a little bit more. Well, recently I graduated from Underling School for the Deceivers uh, with a master and was a master's, excuse me, in fear and worry. Um, and I, I just want to say once again that I truly believe that I am ready for the big dance, sir. An underlings man. Hmm. hmm. Did you know I graduated from underlings? Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was a long time ago, but <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, I had a, I remember my senior project. Mm -hmm. I had to deceive a guy into creating his own religion. How would you do that? You ever hear of Scientology? That was you? I got an A. <laughs> yep. Oh, you know what? That's exactly why I want to work here. That's exactly why I want to work here. I want to be trained by the best. And your agency, sir, is the best when it comes to heaven to hell ratios when, with any of the Devil's Alliance companies. Wow, you did your research. I did, sir. I know everything there is to know about your company, sir. I know, for instance, that last year you had the highest... Temp, temp, uh, tempter on your staff, uh, Pete, uh, Pete the Deceit, Deceit, Deceit yeah. yep, <laughs> Taylor, he was on your staff, and he headed up the uh, Blasphemy Project, and I also know that he also led four mega church pastors into sin, yeah. which destroyed their careers and their lives. Yeah, Pete had a real good leader last year. <laughs> yes. And I also know that uh, your agency was the reason that we now have the enemy's name as a swear word. Yep. <laughs> and I also know that your agency was the pivotal player in taking the word church and making it synonymous with the word boring. And also taking the word Christian and making it synonymous with the word hypocrite. Yeah, we here at Temp Agency, we really take pride in doing our job well. And uh, that's what we have done. We're the best in the, in the business. Mm. Um, so, tell me more about yourself. Uh, what kind of projects are you doing? Well, I would, for, like I said before, I have a degree in fear and uh, worry. And so, I would like to put that more into practice. Um, I'm particularly good at uh, making people worry about the past and the future. Um, my philosophy has always been to make people, <clears throat> to make them deceive them about their past and their future. Okay. Yeah, and... Do you have any examples? Uh, well, for example, last year I uh, convinced a guy to leave his wife, um, hmm. reminding him daily about 
the life that he gave up when he got married. Um, he was in this terrible hair band in college, and I convinced him that he could have a booming career if only he had not gotten married. That did the trick? Not at first, but after I threw in some subtle images, that did the trick, sir. Not the real images of the, his future, of course, but the delusioned reality where his wife was always angry, his job was always going nowhere, and his debt kept on piling up. All three of those things combined with, um, combined with uh, the news radio ads about divorce, my work was done. Oh, well, I don't normally hire people with as little experience as you, um, but I, I do like what I hear. Uh, I, I understand that, sir, but let me just say right up front, I can guarantee you I'm going to work harder than anybody else to bring people to hell. Understood. Here, let's do a little role playing here. Thinking of a guy, mid-twenties, he's struggling with his faith, he's in and out of church, he don't know how his life's going to go and what he, what he wants to believe in, um, and he has a real serious relationship too, and he don't know where that's going either. How would you handle that situation? Mm. Wow. Well... I would first have to get, gather more information first. Uh, it's always better to do the work up front than to wait to the last yep. minute. Check twice and lie once. That's what the old man always yeah. used to say. Yep. Oh, um, however, I, once I figure out his vulnerability, um, I would start off slow. You never want to go into things too quickly because they become aware of you and are more likely to turn to the enemy for help. That's, that's true. Um... What about the church situation? Well, that's fairly easy, sir. I would, if he attended church and when he attended church, I would make him overly aware of everyone else's faults and completely oblivious to his own. I would also make sure whenever he talked to other people that he would, <clears throat> that he would be, consider them fake and insincere. And the same way around, I would make sure that he would be fake and insincere when he would talk to others. Okay. Um, and to throw an extra bit in there, I would play the hypocrisy card in the fact that give him the thoughts like, why does the church always need to ask for money? Why, why do we have to sing this song in church? And even to the point where he would think, I don't need church. I'm way smarter than all this. And if that doesn't work, I would inflate his pride to the point that he would think, I don't need church, and I could do better if I just read my Bible on my own. And I would slowly wean him away to the point that he would be completely engulfed by us. Oh. Okay, what about the girlfriend? Well, that all depends. If she's um, on our side, per se, we, I would make sure everything went smoothly between them. And if this guy had Christian friends, I would probably make deals with their tempters and getting to guy, the, guy to come, the guys come to our guy and complain about their marital problems hmm. to the point that our guy would think that Christianity is complicated and it's not something he wants to be a part of. What if she's a believer? Well, that's a good question. Um, if she's a believer, then I would either give him a grass is always greener complex and f make him freak out about the dab future that lays ahead of him, mm -hmm. or I would push the sexual issue with him and make him go past the limits that he once set for himself to the point that he would feel so guilty of what he has done that it would drive him crazy because all he would ever feel is guilt for what he has done because he's gone past the line that he placed for himself. Wow. Um, you know what? I, I think that uh, sums it up. I think uh, you're a sick, sadistic, manipulative liar. Thank and you. I just want to be the first to say, welcome to the team. Are you serious? I'm serious. <laughs> welcome to the team. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. You're hired. <laughs> Good. And I wouldn't lie about that either. It's perfectly true. <laughs> yes, you would, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. We need to change your name. It, Evan, it rhymes with heaven. Nah, I, we can't have that close sounding. Okay. We're, we're going to call you Scabsworth now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
sick, sadistic, uh, liar, sounds like my kind of guy, right? It's funny. Um, that happens. Th there's attacks that happen in our lives as Christians. And when we live for Jesus, we have an attack on our back. This year, I, uh, or a, a target on our back, this year, I've been trying to really challenge and I've been praying that we collectively would really live for him. God's spirit would move among us and that uh, we'd have a passion to serve him. So if, if you remember beginning sermon series this year, I first talked about listening to God. You, would, would you really like to hear God? And if you do hear God, would you do whatever he ask, ask you to do? Well, if you really bought into that, you're going to fall under attack. Then I talked about depression, overcoming depression. And if you were really able to conquer that and pursue God in that regard, man, Satan wouldn't be happy. He wants to keep us depressed. He wants to hold us back. Then I talked about changing another person that's difficult in your life. And if, if we were able to do that, boy, that would be a great thing for the Lord and it would be something the enemy wouldn't like. And then I talked about changing ourselves. I talked about making the change with the two doors. And again, any of this stuff is going to bring about an attack. The scripture says that, that we will fall under attack. It says, put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For you're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And what it's saying is that this kind of thing isn't fictitious. You might think it is, but the scripture declares that that's the kind of thing that Satan does, that Satan is real. Last week, I talked about uh, the battle between Aramea, uh, Aram and Israel, and the king of Aram wanted to attack the Israel, Israel nation, and yet every time he came upon a, an attack opportunity, they were always ready, and he couldn't figure it out. And, and eventually discovered that they were being tipped off by Elisha. Elisha had an insight from the Lord, a word of knowledge from God. And Elisha would always go to the, to the king of Israel and he'd say, hey, the attack's going to come here or it's going to come at this particular time. And he'd always prepare. And here's the question I have for you this morning. Would you like to know when you're coming under attack? If you knew that you were going to be attacked at some particular place, would you like to have some foreknowledge of that attack? I think anybody would. Like if you knew some bad guy's going to do something bad to you, you'd like to be tipped off. And, and if we'd like to, if, if it would be to our advantage to know that we're going to be attacked spiritually, it would be good to know that. And the interesting thing is that although we don't have Elijah, Elisha tipping us off like uh, the king of Israel did, we do have the word of God and that's what the purpose of this particular passage of scripture is. It's to warn us about an attack. It says this, therefore, I, uh, therefore put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll be standing firm. And so just like Elisha prepared the king of Israel so he was able to stand firm, God wants to prepare us. And, and he tells us that we're supposed to put on armor. And so that's what I have these objects up here for. When we had Easter Fest years ago, we had a Roman soldier at one time walking around in outfits. So I had this and I thought, you know what? I'm going to preach a series of sermons. I'm going to use these as objects to illustrate what I'm saying because we're supposed to put on the whole armor of God that we would be able to stand up against the attacks of the enemy. And the first piece of armor is this one mentioned in the scripture. It says, stand your ground putting on the belt of truth and the body, uh, putting on the belt of truth. That's it, the belt of truth. And so <clears throat> this, is the, uh, this is the belt of truth that we had worn before. Not very impressive compared to uh, the other objects of armor. And I could have gotten a much better one. When my son uh, proposed marriage to Lizzie, at some point we had the opportunity to meet Lizzie's family. Lizzie is from uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland. So Deanna and I went down to meet uh, uh, Lizzie's parents before the wedding. And uh, I liked her father. He had lots of snacks on the table. <laughs> it's like really good. It's his mother, her, Lizzie's mother is from uh, the Philippines. Her father was in the army. They met and got married. And uh, he is an interesting kind of guy. He likes to collect uh, Civil War memorabilia stuff. And he has these little 
soldier type things. He sets up battles. It's crazy. And for a while, he was really into the medieval times, and he put together this, this chained, like, vest. Have you seen that kind of thing? Chain, what's it called? Chain mail? Chain mail. Okay. Well, it, it was a vest that I think wore, weighed uh, 40 pounds. And I put it on. It's like, and if I put on all these objects, I'm never going to be able to get off the floor. But uh, there's places in the Bible where it, it's not called a belt of truth. There are other versions of the Bible. It doesn't say belt of truth. It says girdle of truth. And, and that object, I didn't bother getting it from Lizzie's father. I, I'm sure I could have accessed it. I just didn't want to have him go to the trouble or her go to the trouble and so on. But it, it's just like really protective. Like it would really be hard to take a knife, for example, and shove it through the person's chest if they're wearing this. And then on top of that, the suit of armor, the, uh, the breastplate and th things like that. It's just amazing. So that represents truth. And if we want to defend ourselves against the attacks of the enemy, we have to put on the belt of truth. And so in talking about that this morning, I want to go back again to Nehemiah, which I've talked about several times. And I want to look at one other story that I haven't focused on yet. Nehemiah was, if you recall, called by God to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. And he had uh, gone from Susa to Jerusalem, traveling 850 miles, and he, he oversaw the reconstruction of the walls of Jerusalem. And it was going well. He was like 90% done. 90% done. The, the walls were reconstructed. The framework for the gates were constructed. The gates themselves were constructed. The gates just weren't put in place. That was all that need, needed to remain. And anytime we do anything for God, I'm convinced that we will encounter the opposition of the enemy. And that's what happens in this scripture. So here's, here's what's occurring in the sixth chapter. It says, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet put up the doors and the gates. So Sanballat and Geshem sent a message to me asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized that they were plotting to harm me. How did he know that? Because they had been opponents of his before. And as soon as he knew that they, were, they wanted to see him, right away his, 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 his antennas are up and he's saying, this isn't, this isn't cool. He says, I, I realize that they were plotting to harm me. You may not know it, uh, but <laughs> there's people that hate me. <laughs> it's pe the people are opposed to me, at least. Not a lot of people. Most people love me. I love most people. But there's some people over the years. I've been here 34 years. Every now and then, there's people that just haven't really been big fans of me for one reason or the other. And sometimes some of the things that they've written to me have been pretty unkind and hurtful. And uh, that's, it's okay to criticize. It's certainly okay to correct. I need to be corrected. But sometimes people step across the line and they say really, really harsh things. And uh, sometimes I've gotten anonymous notes. Not a lot of them, but I've gotten anonymous notes. And uh, every now and then these mean things I, I keep. I have a nostalgia file over there and I keep a lot of good things, but I keep some bad things too for some reason. But you know, it, it's never a good experience to get an anonymous note. Has anybody here ever gotten an anonymous note? That's not cool, is it? That anonymous notes are not cool. Because somehow, when, when a person writes an anonymous note, and they're not willing to put their name at the bottom, uh, they, 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 just, they just don't want to have a counterattack or a counter challenge to whatever they're saying. You know what you're supposed to do with an anonymous note that's written to you? You know what you should do? If they didn't sign it, it should be thrown away, first thing. But there's something seductive about an anonymous note. It, it, it seems crazy, but when I get an anonymous note, it's hard to not read it. You're just drawn in, and, and, and it really is hard to not read it. And when I've read anonymous notes, or I've really read vicious things, not tons of them, but occasionally, uh, it, it just messes me up in the brain, messes me up. And so 
there's certain individuals that over the years have written things to me or said things and I, I, I don't regard them as safe. And yet I want to respect them. So when I get a note from somebody like this or an email, I give it to Deanna to read. And I do that to protect myself. She, she reads the email or she reads the note and she, after reading it, decides whether there's anything that I should hear in it. Like, maybe the whole thing I should read. Maybe there's a valid point, and there's a lot of viciousness in it, but there's a valid point within the thing that I should hear. Uh, maybe, maybe there's some blind spot I need to be aware of, and even though it's not expressed, well, I need to hear it. And Deanna will filter that out, and, and, and I, I hear that. Or sometimes she'll say to me, there's, there's nothing here that you should hear. And she deletes the email or she throws the, the, the note away, and I've never seen it. And that's a wise thing to do, I think. I was thinking while I was preaching in one of the other services, there, there, there was a person here in one of the other services that I do that for. They have a person in their life that's vicious, and, and they express themselves in very hurtful ways. And actually, interestingly enough, when that person gets an email from that individual, they don't open it, they send it to me. I read it, I make a determination of what needs to be expressed, if anything, and I protect them in that way. That's, that's protecting each other. And so in this story, Nehemiah has had already experience with these mean people that are enemies of his. And, and he decides right up front, I realize they were plotting to harm me right away. His antennas are up, just like mine are sometimes. So I replied by sending this message to them. I'm engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? What he's saying is, you have nothing good to say to me. And if I attend to whatever you want to express, I'm going to get distracted and pulled away from what I really need to be doing. Very important to do. We need to know what we are supposed to do and do that thing and stick with it. There's some of us in this room that are doing some very important things in our lives. Some of you are parents. Don't let anything distract you from being an effective parent and a parent who would lift Jesus up for your children. Don't mess that up. Don't let your children get distracted by things. There's lots and lots and lots and lots of things that can distract us. All kinds of activities. Don't let the activities supersede Jesus. It's your duty. Some of us are in marriages that are struggling right now or even are healthy. Don't neglect your marriage relationship. Don't get distracted. Don't let anything distract you. No matter how good it may sound, don't let it distract you. You need to build a healthy marriage. That's within the will and the plan of God to be good parents, to be good uh, uh, in our marriage relationships, some of us are called to serve in some kind of ways. We're, we're called to teach. We're called to do whatever. Do not let something intrude and pull you away from that thing. That's what Nehemiah is saying here. He's saying, I know that what I'm doing is what God wants me to do, and I am not going to let you guys distract me. Now, I want to go on, and I want to show you how they attacked him. And I'm actually going to back up a little bit to the previous chapter. This is chapter 6. I'm going to go back to chapter 4 because that's where the first attacks were expressed. And I'm picking it up. I read this before, but it says that the, the, his enemy was flying into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying, in front of his friends and Samaritan army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build a wall in a single day just by offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish, peat, rubbish heap and a charred one at that? That's nothing but a boatload of lies. It's all lies. See, one of the ways that we're attacked by the enemy is through lying. Let me, give an ex let me show you what I'm talking about. What does Nehemiah hearing? He's, he's hearing the enemy say, what's this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? In other words, what do you think these bozos can do here? 
Nehemiah? Do you actually think the men that are working with you are going to be able to reconstruct the walls around Jerusalem? They can't. Now that was a lie. Because in fact, we've, as we read the story, the Jews were able to b- rebuild the wall. They were not feeble, bumbling Jews. They could really do the task. And yet the enemy was saying, they can't do this. And that hit Nehemiah's point of vulnerability. Because if I was in charge of a project like this, rebuilding the walls of, around Jerusalem, my big concern would be, can I pull this off? Have you ever, anybody here ever struggled with that? And he said, can I pull this thing off? I'm not sure I can pull this off. So one of my vulnerable points is, I doubt whether I can really do this. And boy, the enemy played right into that and said, who do you think you're kidding? You bunch of bumbling clowns can't rebuild this wall. Now that was a lie, because they were able to. But it's just like, oh, do you think they can't? He goes on, the enemy says, do you think they can build the wall in a single day just by offering a few sacrifices? No, that's a lie. That's a bold-faced lie. Nehemiah never said any point along the way, we're going to build this wall in a day. He didn't say that. And he certainly didn't say, hey, we're going to just do sacrifices. The wall is going to magically appear. Instead, Nehemiah said, this is going to require hard work. And so this is just filled with lies. They weren't poor, poor, feeble Jews. They, They weren't going to build the wall in a single day. They weren't going to offer just a few sacrifices. They were going to do this thing. But it was like the enemy was saying these lies to attack him at his point of vulnerability. Do you think we can really do this? What, when, when we go on back to the sixth chapter, we find that's not the only way in which the, the guy was attacked. It goes on, it says this. Nehemiah has said, hey, I don't have time to come off this wall and come and pay any attention to you. And then they, and they do that same thing. Hey, come and talk to us. They do that four times. And then on the fifth time, they send a messenger with a written letter. Probably, <laughs> probably one of those certified mail things that you have to sign for, right? You ever get certified mail? and you sign for it, do you ever open those things? Like I always have. You got, you got to open certified mail. So this is a certified letter. You just got to open it. So he opens it, and, and this is what the letter says. There is a rumor around the surrounding nations. Now what is a rumor? A rumor is a bunch of lies, right? Rumors nine times out of ten are not at all true, and even if they are true, there's an element of truth mixed into a bunch of lies. And so it says, there's a rumor around the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me it's true. Oh, well, Geshem says it's true, then it must really be true, right? The rumor is this, that you and the Jews, how many of you have ever had rumors said, expressed about you? That doesn't feel real good, does it? Yeah, a couple of hands go up like, When you have a rumor, it's not cool. It doesn't feel good. And and this rumor, boy, that has a potential to suck me in. Geshem tells me it's true and that you Jews, uh, you and your Jews are planning to rebel and that's why you're rebuilding the wall. According to Geshem's reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Jerusalem. In other words... The real deal for you is not to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. Your real deal is you want to be king. That's the rumor that's been circulating. And what's the attack point? It's his vulnerability of what is his motive. What's everybody saying about me? My real motive is this. And that that messes with me. Doesn't it mess with you? Oh, their real motive is this. That's troubling. And that's what the point of attack was here. What Nehemiah's motive was. Now you've been here for a number of weeks. Did you hear Anywhere in the scripture, it suggests that Nehemiah's real deal was he wanted to be king. Was that there? That wasn't in the scripture. That's not true at all. It was a bold-faced lie, and yet again, it's at a point of vulnerability and has the potential to suck Nehemiah in. But it's not over. The letter doesn't end there yet. It goes on. It says, you can be very sure that this report, that you're just planning to be king, is going to get back to the real king, so I would suggest that you come and talk it over with me. Now, now that, could, that could be a point of fear for him. Like, oh no, not the king. 
The king can't find out. I mean, the king all along has been very, very, very supportive. And I don't want the king to think, if I'm Nehemiah, anything bad about me, that my motives are bad or evil or anything like that. I don't want them to think. And, and so that could just draw me in. It could draw in my fear. And, and yet this is what Nehemiah says. So these couple of lies have been expressed to Nehemiah that could really strike him. He hears them because it came in a certified letter. And this is what Nehemiah says. I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. You're making up the whole thing. There's no truth here. Very important for us to know that there's no truth in this thing. He goes on, he says to us, Nehemiah says to us, they were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. And so I continue to work with even greater determination. But Nehemiah is able to tell the truth. This is not true, the things he's saying, and he's not shaken. It's like Nehemiah knows what God has done in setting him up to build the walls, he knows he is where he's supposed to be. And he's not being dissuaded from continuing that task. He knows the truth. Very important for us to know the truth. If God's Holy Spirit is working in our church, and, and you're genuinely working in some area, you're, you're working on your marriage, your marriage is messed up. And you're trying to get through a very turbulent period of your marriage. Satan's going to throw every kind of monkey wrench into the mix to try to get you off task. Every kind of monkey wrench. And some of it will be bold-faced lies. And you need to hold on to the word of God, which is truth, which says that we got to rebuild this thing. And you got to know what the truth is, know what you're supposed to do, and not waver. That, that's what, that's what we, we need to be able to say the same thing that Nehemiah said. There is no part, no truth in any part of your story. That's what we need to be able to say. There was a time in my life when I was personally attacked, years ago. And, and, and there was actually a physical element to the attack. There was a physical attack for me. And uh, the physical attack didn't hurt very much. It was the verbal attack that hurt. That was the thing that played in my brain. And, and, and I hadn't done anything wrong. Hadn't done anything wrong. I was just standing up for something that was right. And, and it truly was right. And uh, the individuals that were attacking me verbally were just challenging me. And, and there was a certain setting. I don't want to, I've never talked about this publicly before in this, to this degree. I won't go any further than that, but there was a certain setting in which I was with the individuals who were verbalizing this attack. And at one point, the one person was asked, first person was asked, in light of Randy's position on this issue, do you think he should still be a pastor? What should he do? What should he do? Was the question to the one attacker of mine. And the one attacker said, well, I think he should quit. I don't think he should be a pastor anymore. And then, and I was in a weakened condition, very weak in my mind. And then the question asked, was asked to the second person, what do you think Randy should do? I think he should quit. I don't think he should be a pastor if he holds this position, which was in alignment with God's word. And I came away from that experience really, really beaten down. And I, uh, I remember, I've told you before, I often have physical memories. And I remember this was before my mother died. I was standing in my parents' kitchen in, outside of Reading where my father was serving in a church. And I remember standing here and, and the, the breakfast bar thing was here and the refrigerator was over there. And it, I, I don't know if I said it out loud or if I just thought it. I thought to myself, I think I need to take the, the rest of the year off. I need to take a leave of absence. Maybe I should just leave the ministry. That's how I felt. Actually, in that setting, offered my resignation at that time, and it was declined. I was felt very, very beaten down. And so I have a question for you. Do you think it's right that I'm still a pastor? Yes, you say. Yes, you should be a pastor, right? Do you think it's valid for me to be a pastor? Yes. But I was that messed up in my brain that I thought, I shouldn't be a pastor. And, uh, and what kept me going 
was the Word of God. Because when I read the Bible at that time, so weak, every now and then I would encounter a scripture that spoke into my life. Now let me say that we can twist the scripture. Satan twists the scriptures. In, in the opening story, in the Garden of Eden, Satan twists the scripture of what God says. And we shouldn't twist the scripture to our own advantage. And I wasn't doing that. But there would be certain things in the scripture that spoke to my situation very directly. And I literally took my pen and I, I wrote it down on a slip of paper and I stuck it in my, in my wallet and I carried it with me. And every day I would pull that scripture, that scripture out of my wallet or those scriptures out of my wallet when I was feeling beaten and weak in my brain because the statements were only made once but they continue to echo in my brain. That's why Deanna prevents me from reading certain things because it will derail me and get me off task for doing what God wants. And so I would read, when I, my battle in my mind was going on, I would pull the scripture out and I would read it just to hold on to it. And, and what I was doing, really, was I was putting on the belt of truth. And I had to hold on to the belt of truth. What is truth? The truth is God called me to be pastor of this church, and I was supposed to continue to serve in that capacity, even though I heard lies in my head said I shouldn't. I needed to hold on to the truth. I needed to. Otherwise, I don't know what I would have done. I needed to hold on to the truth of God's word, and so I carried it with me. Second illustration. And I've talked about my grandfather before, but my grandfather, mother, father of my mother, uh, we have a picture of him. My grandfather's sitting on the sofa. My grandma's sitting next to him. His shirt is off, and they're holding the baby that we had just had several months earlier. My grandpa was holding baby Meredith. Very small. I remember him being tanned in this picture, and he's holding her. This was, she was born in May. This is October of 1980, and uh, that was the last picture I had of my grandfather holding my daughter. Because shortly after that, my grandfather left my grandmother and uh, had an adulterous relationship and moved from Pennsylvania to Florida. And that resulted in a family tension thing, just like you've had already. If, if there's been that kind of thing that happens, you, you, you're sort of disoriented as to what the nature of our relationships are and how we interact with each other and that kind of thing. And I wasn't involved with much of that because 1980, I was in seminary, I was very busy, we had a new baby, and then shortly after that, in 1982, I came to this church and pastor, very busy. So I was kind of out of the loop of the, out of the family loop of whatever repercussions there were for my family when my grandfather left my grandmother. But um, all I know is that it was some turmoil. And after a number of years, and I don't know the timing of things, my grandfather cut off that relationship with this woman. And in 1987, my grandmother died. My grandmother died. And, and then sometime after that, my grandfather met another woman. Her name was Helen. And he married her. And, and at some point, my grandfather prayed a prayer and invited Jesus to come into his life. And my grandfather was born again at an old age. An old age. My grandfather's cool. Uh, my grandfather uh, was at the age of 75, he was still riding his Harley, and uh, he, he boasted to me one time when I visited him in Florida, he, he rode his Harley at the age of 75, 90 miles an hour. That's my grandfather, okay? But my grandfather, when he trusted in Jesus, he used to volunteer in his church in Florida, and there's a lot of older people in the church, and so they need volunteers, and so my father was an altar boy at the age of like 83. And when I talk to my grandfather, I, I picture him holding this little acolyte thing and lighting the candles in church, you know, ritualistically. And here he is, my grandfather. How cool is that? Well, eventually my grandfather's health declined. Helen died. And um, he moved back to Pennsylvania. He moved into an assisted living uh, place, I think, in Robazonia. And then he eventually went to a nursing home in Myerstown. And Deanna and I would pretty frequently visit my grandfather. Some afternoon, I don't know what afternoon of the week it was, but uh, Friday afternoon maybe, or after I was finished working my sermon, we'd go over and visit my grandpa. 
And uh, while we were there, I remember my picture in my brain is visiting him in the assisted living because he was still, you know, very coherent and with it and so on. We used to play games with him. And because my grandfather loved games all, all my life, loved playing games with my grandfather and family. I was the oldest grandson, the favorite grandson, obviously. And um, so we played games, interact with each other. But one of the games we played in this assisted living place was baseball with cards. Do you ever play baseball with cards? Well, I never had. I didn't know the rules. My grandfather taught us the rules, but my grandfather's like 88 to 92 or something in that range. And, and whenever the rules, uh, my grandfather would change the rules to suit his own needs. So he generally won, <laughs> uh, which I like, no problem with that. I would do the same, do the same. But anyway, uh, my, my grandfather would play the games, but the, the difference for me at this time of my life was I had an adult relationship with my grandfather. I never really had an adult relationship with my grandfather, but with our periodic visiting, we had an adult relationship. And after we finished playing the games and saying whatever we said, we're preparing to leave. It seemed like every single time I ever visited my grandfather, he always seemed to say, yeah, I really shouldn't have done some things in my life. I have some regrets. And he was, he was just caught up in guilt. Guilt, when I, when I was preaching the first service, the image came to my mind. I hadn't premeditated this, but I just think of guilt as like this. If you're walking like this and you have an elephant on your back, that's what guilt is. It's really hard to get anything accomplished with an elephant on your back with this posture. You know what I mean? Very hard to do anything. And that's what guilt was for my grandfather. And I'm not sure how much my grandfather would do at his age anyway, living assisted living or whatever. You know, how, could, how much could my grandfather really serve the Lord? I don't know. But I do know that what, what the enemy said inside my grandfather's head is, who do you think you are? After what you've done, who do you think you are, Frank? To even think that you have value in the kingdom of God. Who do you think you are to say that you even believe you're going to get to heaven? Because he, he struggled with whether he would make it to heaven. Even though he just in Jesus, he struggled with that. Well, why did he struggle? Because he had done something terribly wrong. And you know what I said to my grandfather numerous times as an adult to my grandfather when I visited him? It was a verse from the scripture, 1 John 1, 9, that says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. That's what the scripture says. And what my grandfather needed to do was to wear that like a belt of truth around his heart. Because Satan wanted to take my grandfather out of the game. Satan wants to take you out of the game. Satan wants to take me out of the game. And what we need to do is put on the belt of truth when lies come in our direction. And lies do come in our direction. And just like Elisha warned the king of Israel about the coming attack, I am warning you. If you're genuinely attempting to live for Jesus, you will experience attack. And one of the ways in which you will be attacked, I promise, hands on a stack of Bibles, I promise you, one of the ways you'll be attacked is in the area of lying. Satan's going to lie to you. And he's going to say, whatever your point of vulnerability is, my grandfather's point of vulnerability is, was uh, guilt. My point of vulnerability, one of my points of vulnerability is pleasing people. You know, he's going to attack in those kinds of ways, whatever your point of vulnerability is, and he's going to say lies to you, and you need to stand up against the lies, and you need to base your stand on the truth of the word of God. You've got to stand on the word of God. God's word is truth. And, and he wants you to serve him, and you need to do what is true. You need to lean in on God. You need to dismiss the thoughts of those who would attack you. You need, you need to do what, the, what I have now done with Deanna. I don't even hear some of the things. I've insulated my, the, those tr th that which is not true, I don't need to hear. I'm not going to listen to it. Because I don't want to get off task of doing what God wants me to do. I'm telling you, if God's spirit is working in your life, you're going to hear lies inside your head. This may be 
something, I don't know how you respond to this whole thing of the demons and all that kind of thing, you may think, eh, I don't know if I, guess what? I, whether you like that idea or believe, buy into that concept, which I happen to buy into, whether you buy it into it or not, I am telling you guaranteed, if you're living for Jesus, you will be under attack, and one of the ways in which you will be attacked is lies. And it can take you out of the game. It could have taken me out of the game. It can take you out of the game. You need to put on the belt of truth, which is the word of God. You need to rely on it. Let me pray. Lord God, I, I pray that you would work in our church. I pray that people would have a passion for living for you. Every single day, I pray that they would live for you. Every day, they live for you. And I pray that when Satan attempts to take them out of the game, that they would hold on to truth. Your truth. They wouldn't give it up that they would continue to do whatever is the right thing, continue to do whatever you've called them to do, that they would hold fast onto the belt of truth for their protection. Holy Spirit, come in our church, take over, and help us to be faithful to you and not given into the lies from the enemy. In your name we pray, amen.